Oh, hey, everybody. It's Carl again. I'm back from hell earlier. It smells a lot better in here. It, sm it pretty much smells better in here. Pretty much. Today, I wanted to talk to you about um, tolerance. Pretty exciting, huh? It's uh, maybe particularly important during this time because we're having to deal with lots of people that have lots of signs on their front lawn, half of which we might not agree with. And sometimes I find myself praying to Jesus as I drive down the street. Jesus, just help me get through November 3rd so that the signs will go away and I can start pretending that most people agree with what I believe. <laughs> But we know that's not just that's just not true. That we uh, are called to live in a world with folks that have strange, weird, crazy ideas, and that we're called to in behave in certain ways when we disagree with each other. And I would say not just to make some space so that we kind of don't bug each other, but rather. I think we're called to move from a place of tolerating and starting to welcome others and learning to live together and inevitably moving towards a sense of kind of shalom. So let's talk a little bit about what that might be. I want to introduce you to a relative of mine, and we're going to call him Uncle Rupert. Um, I have a picture of him. Uh, it's right here, and I just want to just here's a here's my picture. Here's Uncle Rupert, kind of a stately guy. You can see how you doing, Uncle Rupert? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, we're not gonna do that. Uncle Rupert grew up in a different time, and by the time he was a little older, uh, he was known in our family as having lots of conspiracy theories about who was running the world and communists and all sorts of stuff. And Uncle Rupert also discovered things like email, which he started to love and would share some of his theories with you, mostly because Uncle Rupert lived far away from where our family lived. We didn't have too much time to uh, engage with Uncle Rupert. But it didn't stop us from talking about him, and not in the most flattering ways. Mostly it was, can you believe what Uncle Rupert just said on the phone or in his latest email? It made me wonder, it makes me wonder, whenever we're presented with somebody who disagrees with us, where, are we, where do we start? How does God call us to start in terms of that basic, just making a little room in our lives for someone whose ideas or behaviors just grind our gears, you know? Well, from the very beginning of the earliest biblical record and the earliest biblical narrative, we are constantly reminded that God is calling us to make space for others, for strangers, because we count ourselves in this world as strangers. So in Deuteronomy 10, we read that you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. It's like the Bible from the right from the beginning of the story starts to say, you should anticipate living among weird people. <laughs> Otherwise, if we don't expect to be living around weird people that believe different things than we do, then we might trick ourselves into thinking that we can create a bubble and we can live our whole lives around others who just believe exactly like we do. Instead, right from Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all these great early parts of our Bible that we, that we use, uh, we are called to interact intentionally with strange weirdos and to welcome them just as we have been welcomed 
when we've been the strange weirdos. So that's great. It's a great place to start. We say, okay, God, we'll welcome the stranger. But what do we do when that stranger really believes weird things and wants to talk about them all the time? The Bible also is clear that we, we should be prepared to have some conversations with folks and we should be ready to be able to talk about where we come from on any given topic. In 2 Timothy 4, uh, we read this, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And here's, I think, the key phrase at the end of this passage. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I think too often we think that in those moments of, I'm going to tolerate you, but I'm really going to win this argument, we veer off into something that's not exactly welcoming, that's not exactly seeing ourselves in the other. And rather, we just kind of want to win the, the game. So what I take from 2 Timothy is, yeah, we should know where we come from. We should be familiar with what the Bible teaches, or we should be ready to explore what the Bible teaches if we don't feel like we already know. But we should also assume that each person that's in that conversation, those that collection of us the stranger and them the stranger, is somewhere on that spectrum of knowing what they believe and probably on the one hand, knowing what you believe, and on the other, probably not having a clue. Later in Matthew, there's a whole system for handling disagreements for folks that are in the church. And I just think this is kind of fascinating that it's right there, right in the middle of the gospel in Matthew 18. And too often we, we think we're off on our own. We have to make this all up again. But Jesus actually taught us. It's in this passage where it says, you know, you need to be like little children to follow me and um, a couple other parables. And then there's these instructions. And in that kind of extended passage, we see this kind of platform for how to have disagreements. The first thing is to look at yourself. What part did you play in this disagreement or in your uh, relationship with another person as you've been trying to navigate tolerating them in your life? What part did you play? Is there something that you did or is this just a, an opinion or a feeling that you have and, and maybe you can just let it go? Great, we've solved the problem. That person isn't as strange anymore because we just are able to pray about it and let it go. Now, if you can't and you feel like there's more to work out, then the Bible helps us along that path. It says the second thing that we should do is talk to that person one on one. And we should just always remember that Facebook comments and even texts that you might send to another person's mobile phone don't count. Emails don't count. All of those things can too easily become kind of part of this ballooning public kind of thing. A quick copy and paste means that that conversation is no longer between you and that person. The Bible calls us to be face-to-face, heart-to-heart when we have these conversations. If those really don't go well, we have this kind of next step. And it says, the Bible tells us that we should bring friends. And it's not really like, I'm going to bring my friends so that they can debate your friends. And then my team can win against your team in this disagreement. It's not really like that. It's more like we bring in friends to make sure that the process we're using is healthy that everyone is being heard, and that we're moving in a direction of building relationship rather than tearing it down. But the Bible is also honest. In Matthew, it says, you know, if you cannot solve this disagreement, then you should take some time away from each other. You should walk away. You should treat the person as if they were a stranger in your life. But we know what Deuteronomy 
says about strangers. That's the genius of this whole passage. And even at the end, when we think, I can't tolerate you, you have to go away, or I have to go away. The Bible reminds us that if we are strangers from another person, then what should we do with strangers? Well, we should love the stranger, for we were once strangers. It's genius. I'm telling you, you got to keep reading this Bible. It, it's amazing. But I don't even think that's the end. I think that, you know, the world tells us that we should kind of tolerate folks, folks that look differently than us, folks that believe differently than us, folks that, um, folks who have exercised power in a way that we feel has harmed us. Look out. But the Bible keeps telling us that we should actually be pursuing every relationship that we have, the good and the bad, in an effort to move towards shalom. Shalom is this great Hebrew word. It doesn't just mean, it can mean hello and goodbye, which is great. (laughs) But the deeper meaning of it is that we are wishing for the other person and for ourselves a peace, a harmony, a wholeness, a completeness, a prosperity, a welfare and tranquility. It's all of those things combined for you and for your neighbors and for the whole world. Shalom. That's where we should be moving with every relationship that we have. It's kind of codified in in, uh, the passage from Luke 10, which is really just another borrowing of the Hebrew scriptures in Jesus' words. You know, he's reminding folks that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And to love others like you love God puts it in this whole new lens. It means we're called to love everyone, to build shalom with everyone. This means always. It means everywhere. Uh, It means love God and neighbor with your whole heart. Not a kind of, I love God a lot and I'll kind of let you do your thing. But to love God as you love, to love your neighbor as you love God with your whole heart, Even when you're mad, even when a neighbor is making bad decisions that hurt others, even when you've made bad decisions that have hurt yourself or have hurt others. And if while trying to build shalom with someone, you need space for safety, you should take it. But in the end, we are kind of sent out into the world to pursue shalom, even with our enemies. And in that pursuit, we start to see a sense of what the kingdom of God really looks like. So, let me bring back into the scene my Uncle Rupert. (laughs) When I was... uh, Traveling around in the summer times, uh, after, just after graduating from high school, I was doing some service projects and things down south and uh, happened to be on the road that went right by where Uncle Rupert was living. And I was able to call him up. And I was able to go and stay overnight at his place along the way. We had dinner and he took me around and showed me his retirement community and... Um, we had conversations and I heard about the history and his kids and building the house that he had there with his wife who had passed. And it was in that moment of spending some time. Not too long before Uncle Rupert passed away that I got a sense of what shalom might look like even for folks who believe very differently, behave very differently, look very differently than me, come from very different places than I do. 
a little taste of what it might be like if we can love others as God loves us and as we love God. So thanks, Uncle Ruber. Uh, so tolerate people, yes. Take a deep breath when you see them putting signs on their front lawn that you don't agree with. But also remember, they are not part of some other bubble. We are all a part of this place that God has made for all of humanity. And we're called to have a rich and abiding shalom with everyone. So if that isn't something we should pray about, I don't know what is. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for all the Uncle Rupert's in our life. Even if sometimes we have to grit our teeth when we say that. God, we pray for all those moments when we've behaved intolerantly. When we have decided to love you more than we love our neighbors, remind us that in the life of your son, Jesus Christ, you flipped that script and turned our attention to others as our testament. That in loving them, we are loving you as we take step after step towards peace and welcome and shalom. Amen. Shalom, everybody. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Small Groups. Just a few announcements for you today. First one is we are still collecting canned food. So you can continue to bring that in, and um, the small group with uh, the most canned food uh, will get a prize. Second announcement is we are looking for donations for the Brightmore meals for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, we're also looking for volunteers, so if you don't have that monetary donation, you can volunteer your time as well. Um, our third announcement is that we are trying to fill our Instagram page with gratitude. So we just launched a, a campaign called A Month Full of Gratitude, and we're looking for volunteers to record themselves saying what they're thankful for. Um, if you are interested in any of these opportunities, you can check out um, more information on our newsletter, and um, if you have any questions, let us know.